Now, Vivek, we, you know, we've been talking about the sad state of the Democratic Party, uh, the very obvious corporate rule that we're all experiencing right now. Um, but you wrote a piece in the print edition of Jacobin magazine regarding, you know, what needs to be done in regard to organizing labor in order to win, in order to actually have some leverage in um, these policy fights. And also, of course, to improve um, working conditions and pay and all of that. Uh, but before we get to what you think should be done st strategically or strategy wise, I wanted you to talk a little bit about um, the last time we had a significant American left wing in this country, like in the 1960s. Um, how did that generation understand the relationship between the left and labor? Um, you know, there are two eras when we th talk about the, the, the uh, influence of the left in the United States. There are two kind of distinct eras that one can think about, which in which the left was able to wield influence in slightly different ways. The first one is, of course, from about the early 30s into towards the world, uh, Second World War, where you have a quite gigantic labor mobilization and labor upsurge, which transforms the Democratic Party. In this era, there isn't that much influence of labor inside the party, because the party has been for decades prior a uh, organization entirely of property classes in the South, the planter class, and in the North, the uh, Eastern establishment, which is uh, bankers and manufacturers. That's what the party was. In the early 30s, you get this gigantic labor mobilization. And that labor mobilization is what puts pressure on both parties to which the Democrats are more open. It puts pressure on them to push through the New Deal. And you happen to have a president who you know, actually built and tried to take advantage of that pressure. That was FDR. So that's one era in which the left has real influence. And that's from outside the state through massive strikes, workplace organizing, the creation of the CIO, the Communist Party and the socialists outside the Communist Party are doing all sorts of work. Then the second era is what you brought up, Anna, which is the 60s. The 60s is a little different. You have movements, you have mobilization. There is the civil rights movement. There is also a big labor upsurge at the end of the 60s, early 70s, but it's not anything like what you had in the 1930s. And yet, you get the Great Society, you get Nixon, Richard, Richard Nixon passing some of the most progressive legislation we saw in the 20th century. Why does this happen? It's because labor by now is institutionalized inside the Democratic Party. And even though there isn't a lot of pressure coming from the outside, at least nothing like the 30s, there, there is pressure and real leverage inside the party from a sizable constituency that's tied to labor. Now, what both of those eras had in common is labor is able to flex its muscle in one way or the other, either outside or inside the state. Since then, what you've had is a diminution of labor's influence on both dimensions. By 1980, strikes are ancient memory, they're ancient history. Since the 1990s, they've literally flatlined until about the last two or three years. Labor's influence inside the party is a joke. There is no influence inside the party. What we are seeing now, right today, is the first glimmerings of a possible reemergence of a labor or let's say a left constituency inside the Democratic Party around Bernie Sanders and some of the people that are connected to him. That's where we are today. And just look at the difference it's made. In your broadcast, in your piece earlier, Anna, you correctly talked about how the Biden bills are being eviscerated by corporate Democrats, still. The very fact that those issues made it on the legislative agenda at all is because of the combined effect of an electoral mobilization. It's not a labor mobilization, but it, at least in the elections, there's been some sign of life. And the fact that there's this tiny element within the Democrats, tiny by historical standards, but significant by American standards in recent history, that is able to hold Biden's feet to the fire. Where we are now is that we're seeing that that's just not going to be enough. For it to get further, you're going to have to have one of those two things that you had, either in the 60s, which is a decent sized labor movement having real institutional presence inside the Democratic Party, or like the 30s, which is what we should really all strive for, a massively mobilized movement in the workplace outside the party, which is able to uh, uh, shut down operations in the same way that businesses threaten to shut them down when they don't get what they want. 
And what were some of the factors that led to the new left uh, separating from labor? Was it just that those long haired kids just didn't appreciate, uh, you know, the crusty old uh, union types or what, 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 what happened there? Um, so it, there was blame on both ends. Uh, the By the 1960s, by the time SDS comes around in the 60s, labor officialdom has become pretty fat, pretty conservative. The labor upsurge in the late 60s was wildcat strikes. These weren't official strikes being led by labor officialdom. For the most part, they were rank and file workers doing job stoppages in opposition to what their own labor leaders were telling them. Now, when the students come around in the 60s, they see this and uh, they recognize it for a kind of incipient conservatism and they reject it. The, and they were right to do so. The difficulty was in rejecting it and mobilizing outside the labor movement meant that the, there was a strict <laughs> timeline on how long these student movements could be effective. The fact of the matter is you can shut down a university, nobody really cares. Uh, it's good press, it's good publicity, it gets people riled up. But at the end of the day, universities are not what this country depends on for profits to keep going. So the students' activism was very important. It had a huge impact on stopping the Vietnam War. It had a huge impact on shifting the culture. But they weren't able to wield the kind of power that labor can. This is not all their fault. They happened to be building their politics at a time when manufacturing was going into decline and jobs were being lost and workers were being thrown out. So even those that did enter the labor movement, most of them <laughs> entered it right in time to get fired. So there wasn't a whole <laughs> lot they could do. Once that happened, not, and this is important, the student left at that time, a sizable chunk of it did realize the importance of labor and the labor movement, sort of what the labor, what the left today is stumblingly coming to after a long, long, long period of confusion. The student left did realize it, they tried they failed in large part because it was just getting really hard to get jobs and maintain jobs by the early 70s. And so it would, couldn't be very successful. Once that happened, they made the fatal flaw of embracing the university. Instead of seeing the university as a place to start and then quickly get the hell out of there, they embraced it. And what you got was the gobbledygook and the, the idiotic phrase mongering and the posturing that the intellectual and the student left today is mired in. What do we do um, in terms of those who feel turned off by the laser focus on economic inequality um, that doesn't, in their opinion, adequately address their concerns regarding racial tensions in the country or, you know, identity related issues, which are real. And I think that, you yeah. know, you do a good job in explaining why those racial tensions exist in the first place. But right. there is still this divide. There is this um, disagreement among the left regarding, um, you know, what the focus should be. Right. So. Right. Because I think some um, and I know you've talked about this many times, but I wanted to give you another opportunity to discuss it because I think it's an important issue and we keep right. running into this obstacle over and over again. So I'll tell you, look, I I came to this country and I was 15 and I've been in or around the left now for 30 years. And, I, and I, here's what I've seen. It's almost impossible to get anyone to focus on economic issues mm -hmm. on the left. There's this, it's, a, it's this kind of trope that people trot out that the left doesn't take non-economic issues seriously when in fact, it's all the left wants to talk about. For 30 years, all I've seen is an obsessive focus on race and gender and sexuality. So here's my response to what you're asking. First of all, I deny the premise. It's not the case that the left has a laser-like focus on economic issues. It's a huge struggle to bring economic issues into the left. Second, if that happens, it's a wonderful achievement. It'll be a fantastic achievement if the left always starts every discussion with economic issues. You know why? Because economic issues are always at the forefront of the poor, whether they're women or whether they're blacks. Funny, maybe not funny, tragic anecdote. The great Elysia Garza, the founding member of Black Lives Matter, uh, created this, uh, Nonprofit, not surprising. BLM was in large measure an attempt to start more nonprofits or at least get into them. And they did the largest survey ever of African Americans and their attitudes to social and economic issues. This wasn't um, target, targeted at 
working class African Americans. It was just basically blacks in general, um, in which they oversampled um, LGBTQ and women, not workers. Still, what did she find? The top four concerns, you can go to the, the website and look at this. The top four issues that African Americans said were on their agenda, regardless of class, were jobs, healthcare, uh, student debt, and um, I just one other economic issue. I forget what it was. So now, so who is it that's worried that we're talking too much about economic issues? Well, it's it's the pr young professionals, it's the professional managerial class that today inhabits the left. If you continue to focus on economic issues and some of them decide to quit, well, they sh should never have been in the left in the first place. You cannot have a left that's apologetic about prioritizing economic issues because to prioritize economic issues is to prioritize the concerns of working people, of the poor. And I will guarantee you, if you in fact embed yourselves within the working class, which is majority non-white, majority women, you will never be allowed to get away with being economic reductionists or being class or whatever little your favorite term of opprobrium happens to be if you're on the student left. You will always have to focus or bring in gender, race, sexuality issues. The difference will be you won't be allowed to ignore the economic issues, which is the calling card of an American leftist today. Uh, Vic, I, I, you've been so generous with your time. Um, uh, I, I, I want to let you go soon. Uh, I just want to say I, I, you know, I always, I always love hearing you talk because I, I tried in my life and in, in the work I do to try to keep things as simple and straightforward as possible. And I always admire hearing you talk about these, these very complicated issues in such a simple, straightforward way with such confidence. Um, and I, I, I wanted to just a final question ask. You know, because you, you mentioned that you're a veteran of 30 years on the left. I think most people watching this show, you know, you said that there's like there are younger people who don't have as much experience. Um, I want to I wanted to just ask you as someone who was around the left uh, in the 1990s. Um, how different is it today from back then? Because I think often, you know, the young people who are new to the left, like they, they just see they're like they're excited because becoming part of a political movement is exciting. Um, but then all of a sudden you start running into just constant defeat <laughs> and yeah. there's like a, uh, so is there, but is there a silver lining? Is there some sort of glimmer of hope? Like have things changed in, in some way uh, from the dark days of the nineties or, 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 or not? It's night and day. There's no comparison. The nineties were the darkest of periods. And by nineties, what do we really mean is about 92, 93 to about 2002, 2003, that era. It was in the early 2000s you saw some glimmer when the anti-globalization movement took off, but then 9-11 threw everything underground for about five years. Then it started to come up again in, say, 2008, 2009. The real dark ages were 92, 93 to 2003, 2005. It was, uh, it's night and day. I'll, here are the couple of the ways in which it's different. That was the decade in which the retreat from real organizing and real activism was so total that it never even came up in left groupings, in left discussions. The, the discussions were overwhelmingly around just how to survive, how do we get through this and what to do. And one saw at that time, because it had been retreating into middle-class circles, economic and class issues becoming a non-factor. And every discussion was about how the left is insensitive to race, gender, sexuality, et cetera, and how that's where the real battle was. And it took me a while to understand the reason that was coming up was not because it was true, it was never true. It was never true in the 20th century that the left was insensitive to race, gender, sexuality issues. It wasn't as good as it should have been, but in its time, it was always at the forefront of wherever its society happened to be. The left was always the leading edge on what we today call identity issues. This is true in the US on race issues as well. It took me a while to realize the reason people were saying this wasn't because they were trying to enrich class politics with these other things, but it was because they were trying to excise class from the left. Mm. It took a long time to see that. And one saw it happening in slow motion and it was incredibly depressing. The second thing that was happening was the left was mostly attracting emotional cripples and weirdos. <laughs> People who just didn't fit in. People who, when normal folks is that, come is that an academic term? 
Yeah, it's technical. <laughs> sorry, I, yeah. I had to. I, I, there, I'll, I'll send a, yeah. a glossary later for people who need to, to figure it yeah. out. You basically <laughs> got people who were just were social rejects and needed to go find a place where they would come across other social rejects and feel better about themselves. And that's why this obsessive focus on subjectivity, do I feel good, am I affirmed, you know, this left became affirmation groups, right? Empathy groups, sympathy groups. And so um, what you're getting now for the first time, along with an actual concern with real politics and actually making a difference in the world, is people coming to the left who aren't just a subculture or, you know, people trying to feel better about themselves and their emotional, their neuroses. You're getting people who have other options in life, but they actually want to see something happen. This is all post Bernie Sanders. What Sanders did was he made people realize that they are not alone in their anger or in their sense of defeat, in their desire to see something happen. And once people saw that other people feel the same way, it wasn't just the outcasts and weirdos and rejects who were, <laughs> I know I'm gonna get a lot of shit for saying this, but it's time you just said it. <laughs> Until the left becomes the part of the mainstream culture, the mainstream will continue to reject it. And as long as the mainstream rejects the left, the left is just a, is just a social club. It's nothing more. Yeah. And we're now to the point where, I mean, look at you guys. You, you seem to be, you know, normal people. Yeah. So <laughs> we're, we're to the point where um, you're not just a weird little subculture. And that means you're learning to talk to real people. You're learning to communicate. And the next step will be actually getting working people to listen to you. That's the next step. If that happens. Yeah. Now we're, we're actually entering the domain of politics and not theater, which is where the left was for 25 years. Well, I, I promise you, you won't get as much hate for saying uh, emotional cripples and weirdos than uh, when you confuse the Death Star uh, is in Star Wars, not Star Trek. Uh, that's when you can really get <laughs> oh a lot of Oh my God, hate. I was thinking of the uh, board. That's the nerds so are vicious. Well, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, just, I, just, I want to issue a correction. Subculture. On the show, uh, just to just to protect you uh, from the vicious. Uh, All that hate mail, send nerds. it to Nando, please. Uh, yes. I'm cold and frail. I'll take it. If you enjoyed this clip from Jacobin Weekends, please hit like and subscribe. You can also watch the full episode or catch any future live stream by clicking the join button below and becoming a Jacobin YouTube member. Thank you. <laughs>